A note to the listeners, episode 35 contains some explicit language and mature content. Word nerd. Wordsmith. Wordy. Wordless. Oxford Dictionary says a word is a single distinct meaningful element of speech or writing, used with others or sometimes alone. We say each one matters. No extra words is literature, minimalist style. And we're getting you right to the story. Blue Black by Frederick K. Foote Man in my neck of the woods color steel rules. White, you're all right. Brown, stick around. Black, get back. And sometimes we be so black we be blue. And the rules flip on you. Sometimes they do a backflip when you're blue, black. My papa has a blue, black cousin, Bob White. Our Bob White don't sing or fly. We call him Mr. Blue. We kids call him Uncle Blue. He's special and he know it like some kind of royalty out of our African past. Black people give him an extra measure of respect. We kids just get the hell out of his way. Uncle Blue, do not play at all. A serious man with a serious walk and little talk. Rarely talk. Quiet and serious. But when he talks, we all listen. Kids, adults, even old folks. We shut the hell up and listen. We're going into Sumter with Uncle Blue and his oldest boy, Baby Blue. We take the wagon with the two gray mules, Cain and Abel, go to the dry goods store, go to the feed lot. Walking to the dry goods store, a big white man in an apron talking to an old white woman, blocking our path. Did we go around them? Did Uncle Blue tip his hat, say good day, and move on? No, not at all. Uncle Blue, stop. He wait, impatient for the white folks to get the hell out of his way. You don't do that shit in Sumter, South Carolina, in 1956. Not unless you got a death wish. The white woman sees him first. All of the color drain out of her. Her hand go to her throat. She step back. Big apron man turned to Uncle Blue. Nig, nig, he trying to say, nigga, what the hell is wrong with you? He can't get it out. He stagger back toward his shop, backs into his shop. Saw, saw, he trying to say, I'm sorry, but he can't get that out either. That little old white woman follow us to the feedlot. She polite about it. She stay well back. By the time we get the wagon loaded, there are three or four white folks watching us at a respectful distance. The sheriff come and join them. He not in no uniform or wearing no badge. He stand with the others. What the hell these white folks want? They not a lynch mob. They acting like they in church. No, they acting like they seeing a prophet or something out the Bible. But what do they want? Loaded, Baby Blue and I up on the seat. Uncle Blue walked back to that old white woman that was following us, stopped in front of her. He poked her in the chest with his finger. You healed. He says that. The noise that comes out of her is everything in her. All the pain and joy and despair and hope and suffering painful to hear that sound, fell to her knees, sobbing, rejoicing. Uncle Blue take the reins and we drive away. Later, I asked Baby Blue, what was that all about? A show. White folks expect a show. That's what Baby Blue tells me. Hello there. Welcome to No Extra Words, the Flash Fiction Podcast. My name is Chris Baker Dirsch. I'm your producer and editor. When I was in college, I took a storytelling class. Actually, I took two storytelling classes. I got to take storytelling and advanced storytelling, which was a lot of fun. 
And I had been taking writing classes, creative writing classes, my whole life. I was in Young Authors Month when I was nine, all that stuff. And the very first day of storytelling class, I can remember my storytelling professor saying, storytelling is very different than other things that you do. Storytelling is not writing, although it is. And it's not reading a book out loud to children, although it is that too. It is something totally different. And part of what we did in storytelling class is we had to create our own story and perform our own story. We had to do a folktale retelling and then we had to do an original story. And as a writer, I think that class has helped me leaps and bounds because there's something really powerful about words on paper and to writing a story down. But there's been storytelling, the act of sharing a story since long before there was ever stories on paper. It predates Gutenberg. It predates literacy. It predates all of that. And if you are a writer who can bring your story to life with the storytelling aspect of it, I think it just, it sends it over the top. And so I am eternally grateful to Frederick K. Foote, not just for his story, but for his recording of the story, because really good storytelling, it's different in different cultures, but a lot of times it takes on that feel of a good joke. There's that build up, like you're just, you're ramping up for the punchline. And that's very much how Blue Black is structured. It actually ends with sort of a punchline. At the end, you realize the joke is really on these people that, you know, this guy is not who he necessarily seems to be, but he's messing with them. And so it really is a joke in a way, but it is classic storytelling at its finest. And that's one of the reasons that I love doing this audio form is because it is, we work very much in written fiction. You submit to us just like you do a literary journal. It's short stories. It's all of that. But adding that audio element and last week when we did the one with the pigeons, I mean, it just sends them over the top. So I'm really, really grateful for that story. I like recording the stories of contributors. I like sharing them, but I love being able to throw in some good old fashioned storytelling straight from the author's mouth sometimes. Today's episode is all about that struggle to be understood when you are different. We live in a culture that's really, really good at making people different. And different can make you stuck in your group or afraid of another group, like we heard on Blue Black. Different can also be a super isolating experience, which you're going to hear next on Sheila M. Good's Life in Repetition. I think both of these are really important stories as we think about how we exist and how we move through this world. So I am going to get you to that So much exciting stuff coming up. Poetry submissions are now closed. I'm going through those. You're going to hear poetry and short stories in April and just so much wonderful stuff ahead. So I'm getting you to life in repetition. I will see you next week here on the No Extra Words podcast. You guys take care. Life in Repetition by Sheila M. Good The crustless cheese toast lay untouched on Nate's plate. His small finger indentions of protest didn't count. Yesterday, Sargento on toast, as he called it, was the only food he'd eat. Today, he didn't like the texture. Karen sighed, took a bite, and added it to the growing list of offending foods. She grimaced at the milky taste of cold cheese washed it down with the last of her coffee, and threw the rest into the trash. She gathered the crumbs in her hand and ran the dishcloth over the table. Dropping the rag into the sink, she dusted the crumbs from her hands and rested her elbows on the counter to watch her son. Bent over in intense concentration, he sat Indian-style on the den floor, building towers with the same alphabet blocks he received on his second birthday. If she didn't intervene, he'd sit there all day the repetitive rhythm keeping him entertained for hours. Repetition, the story of her life, not exactly how she envisioned motherhood. Karen couldn't remember the last time she'd enjoyed an adult conversation. She missed work, her friends, even Frank, but she didn't miss the constant need to explain, or the arguments. I can't take this chaos. His absurd demands, Frank stumbled over his words, are... Damned inconvenient. Our son is not an inconvenience, Karen said, not believing her own words, even as they slipped from her lips. I didn't sign up for this. Frank's hands flew out in both directions, as if his statement encompassed everything around him. His words hit Karen hard and dead center. You didn't sign up for what? Your son or me? 
Her body trembled with rage. She wanted to stab him in the forehead. Instead, she walked to the door and opened it. Don't let the door hit you in the back. To herself, you narcissistic son of a bitch. Frank grabbed his coat and walked past her without another word. Nate and I don't need you, she said, slamming the door. That was six months ago. What else could she do? Nate was her son. Someone had to take responsibility. As she navigated through the throng of doctors, therapists, and the trial and error of medications, her marriage, career, and friends disappeared. Lunch invitations dried up as fast as her excuses. Until yesterday. All it took to send Nate into a frenzy was an empty box of Pop-Tarts. Lying in the middle of the floor, he refused to dress for school. Only a promise to replenish their supply saved him from being tardy again. Exhausted from his meltdown, no makeup, and looking haggard, Karen stopped by the store on her way home. She ran into her old friend Gail in the breakfast aisle, looking impeccable as always. Karen! What a surprise! How are you? Hello, Gail, she said, ignoring the inquiry. Gail didn't really want to know, and Karen didn't have the energy for small talk or the patience for looks of pity. She ran a hand through her ponytail, wishing she'd at least slapped on a little makeup. Emma, you remember Nate's mom? Gail nudged her daughter forward. Say hello, sweetie. Hello, she said, snuggling close to her mother. Gail rested her hand on Emma's shoulders. Nate with you? No, at school. Karen raised the box of Pop-Tarts. I promised him an after-school snack, she said, easing past them. I'll call you, Gail called after her. We'll do lunch. Sure. Sounds great. Karen waved over her shoulder as she hurried away, leaving them standing in the aisle. Gail didn't call, but she hadn't expected to hear from her. The invitation had been an act of politeness, and Gail, if anything, was always polite. No one understood the turn their lives had taken after Nate. But neither had she or Frank. They had been as confused as everyone else. Frank refused to accept the doctor's diagnosis. Instead, he blamed her. For Christ's sake, Karen, stop babying him. The only thing wrong with Nate is his mother. A good smack on the bottom and he'd stop that nonsense. Early on, she wondered if Frank was right, second-guessing her abilities as a mother, but her instincts continued to scream something was wrong with Nate. She tried to keep life normal, but it wasn't. It became easier to stay home, away from all the stares and questions. Karen squatted next to Nate, noting the blonde curl hanging loosely across his forehead. Her fingers itched to brush it aside, but he didn't like to be touched. What you build in? No response, not even a glance in her direction. Lost in his own world, he continued stacking his blocks. Some days he built towers, other times spelled out word combinations. Words she didn't recognize without the help of Webster. Can I play? His fingers tightened around the T-block, pausing in midair. Karen tensed and waited. His tantrums could be monumental. Nate added the block to the tallest stack with steady precision. Just once, she'd give anything for him to look at her, talk to her, call her mommy, like other little boys, or let her run her fingers through his curls. Attempts to converse with him most of the time were futile. When he did talk, the conversation became a litany of encyclopedic details on his latest obsession. This week, it was a favorite word. "'Your dad's coming today. He has a wonderful weekend planned,' she said, praying he did. Nate ignored her. He didn't like the sitter Frank hired to help him on his weekend visits. "'If you're going to hand him off to a stranger, Frank, leave him here with me.' Karen suspected the woman was more than a sitter to Frank. "'Why don't I help put these away?' Her hand hovered over a block. You need to change clothes. Dad will be here soon. She lifted the one under her hand. Come on, we'll do it together. Nate lashed out in rage and protest, scattering the tower of blocks. Karen jumped back, escaping the wrath of his kicking legs. She wrapped her arms around him from behind, the way his therapist taught her and waited. Remain calm and firm. His world feels out of control. Your arms offer him a safe place. Karen could relate but no arms were waiting to comfort her. Stop, Nate. The tantrum had lasted only minutes before he sagged against her, his small chest heaving from the effort. Did Frank hold him? She kissed the top of his head and brushed the curl from his forehead, releasing him as he pulled away from her touch. He jumped up, muttering his latest word, transgression, wiped his face with the back of his hand, and stormed from the room, leaving more than scattered blocks in his wake. Tears filled her eyes as she sank to the floor wrapped her arms around herself and watched him leave. 
What did a seven-year-old know about transgressions? The doorbell rang, filling the room with Frank's stupid school anthem. She wanted to rip the box from the wall. Maybe Nate understood more about transgressions than she gave him credit. Karen took time dropping the wooden alphabets into the bucket for the millionth time and returned it to the shelf. The doorbell chimed a second time, then third. Karen smiled at the image of Frank fidgeting in the cold on the other side of the door and went to check on Nate. Frank could wait as long as it took. It was past time he experienced a bit of inconvenience. Thanks for listening to the No Extra Words podcast. For more information on today's stories and contributors, or to learn how to submit your own work, please visit us at noextrawords.wordpress.com. The best support you can give the show is to recommend us to your family and friends. See you next time.